Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. My name is Kelly Van Beveren. I am a Senior Policy and Communications Associate at Achieve, and I'm very excited to welcome you all to this webinar on Achieve's new uh, framework for evaluating cognitive complexity in mathematics. And um, just a couple of logistical pieces before we dive into why we're all here. Um, you should be automatically muted as you join the, um, the webinar today. We ask that you please keep yourself on mute for, for most of the presentation just to minimize that background noise. You are able to unmute yourself if, if need be, if you'd like to ask a question, um, but please during the rest of the time, keep yourself muted. Um, you can also ask questions through the chat box, which I am just seeing there's a question in there about the phone number. I will um, send the phone number through the chat box um, shortly, but feel free to send in questions to the group chat throughout um, and we'll see those and our presenters will be able to see those and address them. And finally, if you are not able to um, stay for the whole time or if you have a colleague who wasn't able to join today, we are recording this webinar and we'll be posting it on the Achieve website soon. So we um, will send around the link to that afterwards. So with that, I'm excited to introduce Shelby Cole, who's a mathematics specialist at Student Achievement Partners, and Ted Coe, who is the director of, of mathematics at Achieve. We're both uh, instrumental in the development of this new framework and will be taking us through the tool today. So with that, Ted and Shelby, please take it away. Hey, this is Ted. Can you guys hear me okay? All right, fantastic. I am sitting in an airport in Des Moines. That's why if you're here in the background, I want to apologize in advance. If you're here in the background, airport sounding announcements, it's, it's my mic. And I apologize for that. On the flip side, if you are also in the Des Moines airport at this moment, come on by. I'm sitting by gate A2 and join me for this webinar. Hey, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for joining us. This is the uh, we've been working on this idea of thinking about cognitive complexity in assessment items for quite some time. And, and to, 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 get you, to get you zoned in on the conversation that we're about to have, I want to ask you two questions. Right? And the, first one, uh, the first one is, what do, you, what do others hear when you use the word rigor? And uh, this is just a reflection question. I'm not going to be, we're not gonna, you can type in matches if you want, but uh, uh, because I'm on my phone, I can't actually see them. Uh, what do others hear when you use the word rigor? It's a word that we know in, in our circles, in our, in our uh, math world that we're in, that everybody tends to use that word a little bit differently. Um, and then the question that you want to reflect on is, what do you mean when you use the word rigor? Does, does, it, does it just mean uh, harder? Does it mean more? I, I, I think for, I, 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 like to, I, I like to look in the dictionary and see, well, what does, what does, the, what does the dictionary say? And when, you, and when you look at the dictionary, you see that, the, well, a rigor means harsh inflexibility, uh, unyielding, cruel. And, and, and maybe that does describe the mathematics classroom in far too many cases, but that's not really what we're getting at. A tremor caused by a chill makes life difficult. Or down at the bottom, rigor mortis. You know, like, wow, it's, 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 a, it's a line to death in some ways. And in fact, I can envision this, this world where, uh, you know, you've got a teacher who says, hey, hey, I, I gave a really rigorous mathematics homework assignment. Look at this. And then the teacher next door says, oh, yeah, that's nothing. This, this is what I gave. I gave this one. And then the next teacher says, oh, yeah, well, that's not rigorous. This this is rigorous and the next one no this this is even more rigorous no no the next one goes and you just keep piling this on and on and on and eventually you 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 you've got to come to this notion that look rigor doesn't mean that it's more it, it's more difficult it doesn't mean that i'm doing more math it doesn't mean that i'm doing harder math it means something else and yeah i did actually go ahead and build that last one out just to drive the point home that uh that's not the point of rigor and and i like this quote from mathematician jordan ellenberg he says too often, we teach our students that doing mathematics means manipulating clusters of digits according to the rules presented to us by the teacher. That's not math, he says. And when we teach our students to do that and only that, we're training them to be slow, buggy versions of Excel. That's not what it's about. That's not what rigor is about. And so uh, here we are in this conversation just talk about, well, what, what could we say about rigor when it comes to summative assessments? Shelby, let me turn it over to you. Great, thanks. Um, so one of the things that is really important as we were thinking about this idea of cognitive complexity and really thinking about it with respect to the college and career ready standards that states have 
now had in place for nearly a decade in most places is how do we ground this work in the same shifts that those standards were grounded in? And so we've been working with the same three shifts that we've been talking about for the last 10 years. The first of which is focus, which asks us to really go in depth with some of the most important mathematics and giving students time to learn it each year. And so even if some people said there are not fewer standards per year, there definitely are fewer topics and those topics are much more focused within each grade level. Um, the second shift is coherence, and that's thinking both across grades as well as within grades. And the shift we're going to focus on most today is um, the shift of really re thinking about what mathematical rigor could be and what it should look like in classrooms. And the shift of rigor, as we've defined it with the college and career ready standards, is really thinking about having approximately equal intensity devoted to conceptual understanding, procedural skill and fluency, and application. Um, and so much of what we talk about today will be grounded in that third shift, Al although I would say like we will dip into coherence a little bit because part of understanding mathematics in depth is being able to make connections across mathematical ideas. And so that's part of the notion that we've grounded this new framework for complexity in. Um, the other thing that I'd just like to mention is that, you know, working on this for 10 years now, um, what, what we're really trying to do is ensure that all of the components of systems are aligned to those same three shifts. And so for the past 10 years, we've been working on different tools and ways to think about alignment across assessment, um, teaching and learning, as well as instructional materials. And so if you're to look at some of the things that are mentioned here, as well as like, there's even more than are listed here, all of those things need to be grounded in, in the same three shifts that we, we just talked about. And so if we look back you know, 15, 20 years before many states adopted college and career ready standards, we had really different notions of what it meant to be aligned to those standards. And so as we started, as we became more similar across states, it gave us the opportunity to really think about how to drive change so that all of the tools and resources that we're working with are grounded in those same three shifts. And even as states make minor changes or even slightly larger adaptations to the standards, the one thing that, you know, Ted's organization and our organization often is really looking for is, did they retain the shifts of focus, coherence, and rigor? And we're going to start by grounding this conversation. You know, all of this work started um, in thinking about assessment. And so, Ted, I'll let you kick us off on that. Yeah, and another reminder to the importance of this work comes from the uh, American teacher panel that Rand convened. Uh, they, and, they, and they observed this. We also observed some differences in the aspects of rigor that teachers chose depending on the students they serve. Uh, they said that they're not conclusive, and I don't think they were in their study, but they suggest that teachers in lower income schools and those who have spent more years in the classroom could be focusing more attention on procedural skill and fluency compared to conceptual understanding and teaching standards. And so we see there, 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 there are other issues and, and issues of equity and access that are embedded in this notion of rigor as we're choosing to look at it. So this particular work grew out of our, our attempts at Achieve to uh, provide statewide summative assessment reviews. Uh, so, so for instance, uh, in this case, uh, the report that's up on the screen was uh, an analysis that we did on the alignment of the ACT to the Common Core State Standards. Uh, and, and you can go pull this up and, and if you want to see the, you know, how, how the story ends on this one. Uh, but, but the reason I'm pointing this out to you is because to, to do this kind of work, to do an in-depth piece of work, we, we actually had to, uh, to work on, a, on, on revising a methodology, finding something that, something, something that worked. And it, and, it, and it turned out that the place that we, that we went from and, who, and we built from Fordham and Humro and they're using these things from the uh, Council of Chief State School Officers assessment criteria. And they have five criteria. We're going to focus on a couple of them today. Uh, the first one is that they focus strongly on the content most needed for success in later mathematics. The second one, which is one we're going to spend a lot of time on here, is assessing a balance of concepts, procedures, and applications. It turns out that's a tough question uh, to figure out. How, how, do you, how do you look at that when you look at a collection of assessment items? Uh, C3 was connecting practices to content, and C4 requiring a range of cognitive demand. And then C5, ensuring a, a high quality items and a variety of item types. But to begin this conversation, then we're going to really uh, work on C2. And in particular, 
This is about assessing that balance of concepts, procedures, and applications. And, and the idea is that uh, all of these things need to be in there in some balance, in some way, uh, according to the criterion. Uh, this also lines up with the National Math Advisory Panel's recommendation from their 2008 report that, uh, you know, preparing students for algebra, the curriculum has to develop conceptual understanding, fluency, and problem solving skills. These capabilities are mutually supportive, each facilitating the learning of others, right? And so it, it, we're, we're past the point of, of sort of debating the need for this balance. And the question is now, what is that balance and, and, and how do we find it? Shelby, go ahead with that next one. Okay, great. So, um, you know, when when we first started this work, it's, it felt like we had three categories, right? There's conceptual understanding, procedural skill influence, and the application. And so, you know, of course, I'm thinking, how hard can it be? You look at an assessment question, you throw it in one of the buckets, you move to the next one, um, which is, is precisely what they tried to do when, they, um, when the Fordham Institute did an evaluation of four assessments, uh, Smarter Balanced, Park, the, the MCAS, which is the Massachusetts State Assessment, and the ACT Aspire. And they, they were trying to classify items by those three categories to determine whether indeed the assessments were balancing on those three things. And what they found was that it wasn't so straightforward. It was really hard in some cases for them to say, this is purely an application question, this question is purely conceptual, or it's purely procedural skill and fluency. Um, and so you see that in the final report, it said due to variations in how reviewers understood and implemented this, this criterion, final ratings could not be determined with confidence. So now we were in a, in a situation where we have five assessment criteria, one of which we weren't um, at that point in time able to really evaluate whether assessments were meeting it. And so this is when we started to really dig in to um, thinking about uh, these three aspects of rigor and how we could more effectively communicate through metadata what what an item was measuring with respect to those three things. Um, so we started, we did a lot of exploratory work in, you know, we started the same way Fordham did having people try to classify them just to uncover what some of the issues were with single um, category classifications. And right away, we saw people ha struggling to classify them and really surfacing some of the issues. And I'm gonna pull up the whole matrix actually, because one of the interesting things was that there actually wasn't such thing as a pure application question because any mathematical application, which um, in this particular case in our work, we've defined very explicitly as essentially meaning word problems, that the problem is in a real world context, whether you want to, you can argue over whether it's real, real world or contrived real world, but in any case, we have a very clear definition, which means that the problem is embedded in some sort of real world context. And there's a few people who didn't quite agree with that definition, but the nice thing from an assessment perspective is it makes very clear what's in that bucket. And so any question that we see with an application tag on it, we know contains a real world context. And from a design perspective, that's really good information as I'm trying to build a balanced test. Um, but from this, we learned that there was no pure application. Every problem that we looked at that had a real world context, and I guess I should say thankfully, also had some element of procedural skill, conceptual understanding, or both, because if you just have a context and don't have one of those other things, it's hard to imagine what you're actually doing with the mathematics. Um, the other thing is we looked at some work that had been done on procedural skill and fluency and conceptual understanding. And, you know, the, the challenge, of course, is that those things are not like, they're not two buckets. There's, there's sort of this continuum where an item can be extremely conceptual. It can be almost entirely procedural where the student has a, a sort of memorized known way to do it without a lot of thinking. And then there's, there's even more cases that fall somewhere in between. And so we needed a way to classify items that fell, you know, somewhere in between procedural and conceptual. And so that's where we get this middle category that it either um, the question is, is explicitly targeting both, or there are some cases where you have a item that maybe is intended to be conceptual, but we know that some students can actually um, sort of power through it in a way that's much more procedural looking. And so we defined for, in this work, 
Um, we found we needed a very clear definition of what a procedure was, um, in part because I think people sort of have gotten used to classifying anything that's sort of low level complexity as procedural. And that's not exactly the case. So we wanted people to know that a procedure here, we're really thinking about a step-by-step -step sequence that can be memorized and executed without understanding or attending to me. So at some point, the students have a known way to manipulate the problem without really doing any, any thinking about it. Um, the other thing that we've classified into this bucket um, for in, in, is there's a few um, standards that actually require students to know something from memory and there's no clear place to put those. And so because the shifts have sort of classified procedural skill and fluency into a single bucket, we've put some of those fluency um, and no, those know from memory expectations in this bucket as well. Um, in conceptual understanding, we wanted to make sure that um, there are other things that can add to complexity, such as, you know, a poorly written item, right? So in this particular framework, the conceptual understanding that we're talking about is referring to the mathematics itself. If you have a poorly written question, like that should be, that's certainly something you should evaluate, just not as part of the, the work on, on cognitive complexity that we're gonna talk about, which we want clearly grounded in sort of the mathematical ideas. Um, and then we drew some lines around sort of what, what would be in the application bucket and what would be out. And so, you know, if Julia is doing something with a rectangular prism, um, but that rec rectangular prism isn't within the real world context, like we're not gonna say it's application just because Julia is doing it. Um, so we drew some lines to, I mean, some of those questions would just be bad anyway, but we drew some lines around it to make sure that the things that were coming into application were really clearly defined. So I'm gonna just talk through a few examples. Um, and I, I will talk later about how the NBT domain doesn't require any application in the Common Core Standards anyway. Um, but I did put an example in here just so I could keep these three examples within the same context of multi-digit subtraction. So in this first case, we've classified these as purely procedural. These items come from the Smarter Balance item specifications. Uh, the item writers didn't, in, didn't explicitly target anything that, that remotely looks conceptual. And so these are an example of some computational items that we would classify as purely procedural. Um, we hope that item writers drive more and more toward targeting actual conceptual complexity and really getting students to think about things like relationships between operations, place value understanding, um, and the properties of operations. All of those understandings would be useful in completing a problem like this as, as opposed to the one that we looked at before. And you can imagine a student who only learns the standard algorithm and skips over all that conceptual work would, would probably have a harder time with a question like this, which is more clearly targeting conceptual understanding. But as you'll see, we've also tagged sort of procedural skills. So there's also some prior fluencies, for example, that are useful in completing this particular question. And then here's an application example. Um, this particular example also um, requires some conceptual understanding as well as some procedural skill and fluency. And so here we've highlighted all three. Um, in the cases where all three are highlighted, we sort, of, we, we, we sort of think of application as sort of the lead aspect of rigor. It's an application problem that also requires students to draw on conceptual understanding and procedural skill and fluency. But it's useful to know the full profile of the question so you really can think about the idea of balance um, as you're building a test and think about those things more holistically. So just to talk specifically about the NBT progression um, and why sort of rigor, this conversation about rigor matters, the, the notion of conceptual understanding, procedural skill influencing and application is in many cases, you can read the standards and sort of look at and think about what they're targeting. So the end of this progression, or I don't think we always call it the end of the progression, but um, sort of the last standard that really thinks about multi-digit addition and subtraction is for NBTB4, where students are now asked to use the standard algorithm and develop some level of fluency with multi-digit computations. That comes after, and, and if you're not familiar with this tool, by the way, this is the, a coherence map on 
our website, Achieve the Core, which shows some of the connections both within grade level and across grade levels for the standards. But if we think about this progression of addition and subtraction, um, my colleague and I designed this, um, this sort of table to think about this work, which is students are off, the full circles here basically mean that there's a fluency expectation for addition and subtraction within 10, within 20, within 100. And the half circles sort of reflect this idea that the conceptual foundations are being built. And so in the NBT domain, there's actually no requirement for word problems. So as these circles get filled in, there's an interesting thing about the progression of standards. And so as kindergartners become fluent within five, they then start to solve word problems with operations within five. So as the fluency expectations are sort of reached, then we start to talk about word problems that leverage those numbers so that we're increasing the con what students have already built conceptually and now are getting to some level of fluency. Now we're introducing word problems. And so there's a very specific progression within the standards that ensures that we're not trying to do too much all at once. And so it's, it's really important to pay attention to what the actual standards call for and make sure that we're leveraging that as we design assessments. All right, so here's one of my favorite domains to talk about, and the timing is good because I think our, our organization is actually releasing an assessment, um, a mini assessment, we call them, for this particular domain. But I'm just going to give you some time to just scan over. We can just look at, for today, the headline standards, so standard one, standard two, standard three. And of the three aspects of rigor, conceptual understanding, procedural skill and fluency, and application, which of those three do you think is primarily required as you scan those three NF standards? And if you're brave and want to chat that, I will take a look at the chat. Oh, Carol's here. Hey, Carol. <laughs> All right, we have two conceptuals. If we can get one more person to weigh in. All right, thanks, Jennifer. All right, so it's probably not groundbreaking news that when you see the verb understand, which some places are trying to cut from their standards, but I don't recommend it. So when you see this word understand, it's it's probably a good signal that you're that there's something about conceptual understanding being targeted. It wasn't a word that many in the assessment industry were excited to see when these standards came out because it's harder to measure, right? It's harder to think about what it looks like to write questions that understanding versus those that target procedural skill. Um, I like to talk about this particular grade and domain because it's almost entirely conceptual. There's nowhere in the domain where you really see solve real world problems. There's nowhere really in the domain where you see procedural skills except you could make a, a couple of arguments maybe about generating equivalent fractions or even the way in which partitioning happens. But primarily, this is a conceptual domain. And so if I were to scan you know, instructional materials or to scan an assessment, what I would expect to see is 95% of those questions should be measuring conceptual understanding. Maybe 100%, but I give people 5% of freedom. Um, so let's take a look at, and these, these are two questions that will be that are from actually the mini assessment that we're gonna be releasing hopefully this week, but I don't, I don't remember the exact date. Um, just take a look at those from a mathematical perspective. Um, it's probably an easier task if you know the three, grade three standards really well. Um, but I just wanna think, want you to think about the mathematics that you need to answer each of these questions. And we'll come back to them later, so we don't need to chat about it yet. 
So before I hand it back to Ted to sort of dig into this idea of complexity, I'll just draw your point, draw your attention to a very sort of nuanced thing, but these questions don't say what fraction is located at, and it doesn't say drag the fraction two thirds and the improper fraction seven six to the correct location. So one of the major shifts that these standards took with fractions is to firmly ground them as um, part of the number system. So as an extension of the work with whole numbers, as a subset of the rational number system, we've firmly positioned fractions as sort of within, as numbers. And so we're calling them numbers instead of fractions. And that seems small, but it was actually, that's actually a pretty big shift in language for assessment. All right. So Ted, do you want to take over for a bit? Sure. Uh, thanks for that, Shelby. Uh, and as Shelby just pointed out with that last example, uh, you, you put that with the notion that we have six bins of types of problems, right? That we put together as uh, as our way to evaluate criterion C two. What you what it can't tell the difference between is whether one is more complex than the other, right? And so this is this is an issue because. Uh, not only could it be more or less conceptually complex, but also particularly in the world of application, right? Where you could you could load up an assessment with application items that are all very low complexity, and so uh, this is this is where we knew the thinking had to go next, um, and it also is what's covered in Criterion C.4. And uh, if you go back to, for instance, our our review of the ACT document that we showed you earlier, it it referenced DOK. Uh, because we hadn't quite ironed this out yet when we put that together. Uh, but here's here's a, a sample DOK table, right? So, and, and we look at this level one, level two, and level three, level four. What we see though is that these aspects of rigor are bundled together inside here. So if you look at, for instance, that uh, that second bullet, it may be hard for you to read, but the second bullet of the examples in level three says, formulate mathematical model for complex situation. Well, that would be a nice complex application. But the bullet right below it is produce a sound and valid mathematical argument. So that would be more about concepts. So what we couldn't, what you can't tell with the OK is, is sort of what aspects of rigor are being pushed on to uh, varying levels of complexity, which is uh, where we thought with that C2, assessing the balance, and the C4 requiring a range of cognitive demand, we could put the two together. And so this, this, this became pretty tricky, right? Because thinking about complexity is tough. Park, for instance, tried to tackle uh, the notion of of complexity, the sources of cognitive complexity, and and they they pointed to a number of things: content processing practices, stimulus response processing demands. Right? These these are these are all these are all uh, yes, they are all aspects of complexity. But we couldn't we couldn't spread our our vision too wide. So we thought, well, let's try to talk about complexity very tightly within within the within the range of the three aspects of rigor knowing that there are other others out there but let's just focus on those three uh, and this is supported by what c4 is really getting at and that's uh they're suggesting that the, the development and use of classifications specific to the discipline uh with uh, that, that talk about the nature of reasoning the nature of computation and the nature of applications it's embedded it's embedded right in there and so we thought, well, let's 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 do this. Let's make this work. So, so C two. Remember, just for uh, so you can remember that the, the table with the six uh, the six bins. No, it's the next slide, Shelby. It was uh, keep going forward. One more, one more. Yeah. So go one more. Yeah. So we had this table of this of the six bins, and how do we talk about procedural, conceptual, and application complexity? Um, because we know we know this is really this is really important. So so here here's what we came up with, and it took it took a lot of work. And Shelby, I think just uh, unveil it right now if you would. That would be fine. So uh, the the first was well, you can have varying levels of procedural complexity, and this actually turned out of the three aspects of rigor, this turned out to be the most challenging to to, to work on. And thankfully, we know that uh, the Nate Validity Studies panel was also working on it at the same time, so we were able to borrow a lot of their work for this particular aspect of rigor. Uh, but the idea here is that uh, it can't be about counting steps or anything like that. You just because you just you know we, we couldn't find any agreement on it on what that meant. So what it has to do with is is it, it, let's start with level two. Okay, solving the problem entails common or grade level procedures with friendly numbers. That that would be a level two procedural complexity. Level one would be that uh, you're in little procedural demand or it's below grade level. And you say, well, why would we ever want to have below grade level on a, on a summative assessment? Well, sometimes you want below grade level procedural complexity in order to elevate the concepts 
that that you're trying to to work on. So we we knew that we wanted to have that as a, as a possibility. And then on the flip side, you've got level three. Solving the problem requires common grade level procedures with unfriendly numbers and unconventional combination of procedures, or requires an unusual perseverance or organization skills in the execution of those procedures. And and uh, What's, so, so we had to then define what do we mean by friendly and unfriendly numbers. Well, unfriendly numbers are the kinds of numbers that are in the problem such that if the student misses the problem, we don't know whether it was because the numbers were messy or because they didn't get the procedures right, right? So, so that, that, that's part of what we're saying with unfriendly numbers. All right, so that, that was procedural complexity. Level two is, is grade level, level one's below grade level, level three is we've, we're throwing all kinds of procedures at them. Now let's go to conceptual complexity. Okay, so, and, and this, and as, you're, as, as we're going through these, I want you to think back to that example of the pair of uh, number line problems that Shelby shared earlier. So, level one, solving the problem requires students to recall or recognize a grade level concept. We don't need to relate concepts or demonstrate a line of reasoning. To get to level two, an item uh, should have students relate multiple grade level concepts of different types, create multiple representations or solutions, connect concepts with procedures or strategies. They might do some reasoning, but they don't necessarily have to demonstrate a full line of reasoning. And then level three would be solving the problem requires students to relate multiple grade level concepts and to evidence reasoning, planning, analysis, judgment, or creative thought, or to work with a sophisticated, non-typical line of reasoning. So that's our, that's our conceptual complexity. So if an item is tagged in one of the six bins with, the, with conceptual, then it's also going to align to one of these three levels. That, that's our thinking. And then for the, for the last strand, we've got yeah, application. Well, just before, yeah. before we move to application, I just wanted to add like the, one, of the, one of the things that we found as we were sort of validating some of this work is that I think that people had become so accustomed to DOK1 that in, many people had equated DOK1 with procedural problems, yeah. even though there's a lot of problems that don't have a procedure that are still low level complexity. So a lot of these many conceptual complexity level one problems would also fit into DOK1, except with DOK, you're unable to disentangle the, whether it's like a conceptual mm -hmm. sort of definitional type of problem versus a, um, an actual procedural problem. Yeah, yeah. And so conceptual doesn't mean harder. Procedural doesn't mean easier. Procedural doesn't mean bad and conceptual meaning good. None of, none of that's alive in this document at all. Uh, application complexity, the way that we want you to think about this is think of it as a continuum to modeling, right? So modeling requires some real world context. That's what this is aiming along. Uh, that's, that's a requirement to even open up application as Shelby mentioned earlier. Level one is this type, of, this type of word problem where the mathematics that you need to solve the problem is directly indicated or obvious, right? It's just, it, it tells you, right, John, John had three apples and he added five apples. How many apples does he have now, right? You didn't have to, you didn't have to do any extracting from the context to get the mathematics. Level two is, uh, it does require you to interpret the context and determine the procedure or concept. Uh, the mathematics is not immediately obvious. They have to do some uh, decision making. Level three, with regard to the application. Level three is, in, the, in addition to that uh, interpretation of the context, they also have to move more toward the full modeling process. So recognizing features, formulating, computing, and interpreting results as part, as part of a modeling process. Um, so, so those are our three, and they all live together in a single chart, which I think we have on the next slide. And it's also in the... Uh, PDF version of the of the document, and we'll share that link with you later in the chat. Uh, now, now with that, let's go back. Let's go back to Shelby's example of the of the pair of problems, and now now you have a new sort of way to think about what these might look like. Shelby, go ahead. Yeah. So as we think about these problems through the lens of what third graders are actually doing, the first one tends um, leans toward a very definite definitional. Um, fraction question. The fraction is defined in third grade as what partitioning of a whole and the, sort of the number of equal increments. And so it's the third, it's on the third mark. If I count them up, I think there's eight. And so I can write three eighths using the way the definition of fraction is developed in grade three. Um, the second one, on the other hand, there's probably multiple ways to enter it. But the first thing that will be shocking to students if they've only learned sort of a 
a, that definitional framework or a very or even a very procedural way of thinking about this partitioning is why is one third on the second mark? You know, so they might be so accustomed to seeing one third after partitioning into thirds that they forget that one third is this fraction, which is a number, which is equivalent to other fractions. And so they can enter it by maybe thinking about this idea of one third being a distance from zero and locating two thirds. Um, they might think about it by saying, all right, well, I have one third, but it's on the second mark. I might want to re rewrite that as two six so that I can then identify where one six is. So there are multiple ways to do the problem, but it's not really the multiple ways necessarily. It's the integration across standards. And so students can think about this in multiple ways, but it's really thinking about content that exists across more than one standard. And so um, part of conceptual level two, one way to reach conceptual level two using this framework is this idea that students do have to integrate ideas from multiple um, standards or even domains. Um, so I think we're gonna share a, just a few example. These, um, our colleagues at NWEA were sort of the first ones to use the framework um, in a very intensive way. They've, they've tagged a, an item bank of, I think, over 10,000 math questions using the framework and also, as part of that process, generated an extensive document to, um, to keep iterator reliability on the coding process um, as tight as possible. And so they have very specific decisions about what is called, one of, the, one of the things that they did, I think this is a procedural level two, and one of the things that they did to ensure reliability within their own tagging system was to clearly define sort of which operations and how many digits would be considered procedural level two, which you might remember is grade level procedures with friendly numbers. So at each grade level, they can clearly identify which things they're going to classify as procedural level two, because at some point, this problem would become procedural level one, right? So if students have, if this is now a year, a year old or a year out of how they've identified it, students have been working with it long enough that it would be classified as a procedural level one and eventually might not be classified at all. Um, but for third grade, it's aligned to this standard. It is considered a procedural level one, or sorry, procedural level two question. Shelby, the only okay, thing I would say is that it, it, before you leave that problem, is eventually it is not a procedural question. So for an eighth grade student, we wouldn't consider it, uh, we wouldn't rate it as a procedural item. Well, if you listen to the recording, you'll note that I did say that actually. Oh, did you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can contrast that with this question, which we showed a similar one earlier, which does require students to draw on some of the other things in standards. So although this is a fluency standard, in third grade, students are still using strategies and algorithms that are grounded in ideas of place value properties of operations and relationships between operations. It's a conceptual level two because of the reasoning required to complete the question, and it also ties ties closely to some of the procedural skills that students are still working on. Um, and so they, they've not only classified these items, but they have identified at the bottom that this standard within our pool will sort of have a balance of those questions. We'll have, a, you know, about half will be procedural level two and about half will sort of focus on some of the conceptual elements of the standard. So it gave them a really nice way to think about their pool through the lens of um, rigor and, and complexity. Um, here's another example. This one is a, um, an application level one, conceptual level one. It's application, again, because it's in a context that uses lemons and Rita. Um, but it's classified as a conceptual level one. And these are, these are fairly rare. Um, often application problems do have some procedural skill and fluency, uh, but there are a few standards, I'd say maybe one to two per grade, where you might see this, this combination of application and conceptual, where students aren't actually asked to execute any computations or other procedural skills. And here's an example of um, a more common type of question, which is an app, which is an application with procedural skill, which we, you'll you'll see much more of. And I guess that's another interesting thing is that these things aren't intended to be equally distributed; they're intended to be 
in line with what the standards ask for. And so lots of times application problems will be paired with procedural skill and fluency. So if I'm looking just at the metadata for this and I don't read the question, um, reading that it's an application level two will tell me that students do have to do some sort of formulation, like it's not gonna be clear just from reading this problem through once what, what they're expected to do. The procedural level two will tell me that the skills within the problem are at grade level. And so there, as Ted mentioned earlier, there are times where you'll, where you'll see application level two and procedural level one. And, and in many cases, that's fine, right? If I'm doing a perimeter problem in the first place where perimeter comes up, I might draw on some procedural um, some computations that are below grade level because my emphasis is on this new concept of perimeter. And so it's, it's, it's entirely fine for procedural to be at level one, but not if it's by itself. If it's by itself, if it's just procedural, we want to see those at level two, indicating that they're at the right grade level. So the other neat thing that um, NWEA did was to really think about rigor at the domain level. And so um, you see some interesting things if you look at this. One thing you'll notice on the left is what I mentioned earlier. The NBT domain doesn't require any application, and this was a place where NWA is moving toward a pool that doesn't have any word problems. And so they'll be able to send a very clear signal if they ever just decide to report an NBT score. We'll have a very good idea of what that means. I know that it's strictly focus on mathematics that is conceptual and procedural and that the students didn't see any word problems, which is consistent with what the standards say in this case. You'll notice some other interesting things that tell us something about the progression. So if I look at the NF domain in grade three, which the number and operations and fractions, the third one over, um, you see that it starts off very conceptual, as I indicated, there might be a few procedural problems on um, generating equivalent fractions. But otherwise, it's very conceptual, and the application comes in later. So if I look down at grade five, now the vast majority of the pool relative to number, actually of the whole pool, but even within numbered operation fractions, most of those problems at that point are now application. And so you, you see something about the progression, and you see an assessment that's, that through the lens of rigor is able to align to the intent of the standards in a much more explicit way. All right, so um, we have some closing thoughts, and then I think we'll I think we have time for some questions if there are any. Um, the first thing that we'll say is that, and this was I hope this was a uh, something people were doing more sort of in the first five years of the standards and less so now, but it was all three aspects of rigor all the time. And so if I'm teaching this standard, I'm going to do it conceptually, I'm going to do it procedurally, I'm going to do it through um, word problems. And that's certainly not what it means. It means read the standards and really try to elevate the aspects of rigor that the standards are calling for. There's some very clear language in some cases. There are certain, all three, um, but the domain can often tell you a lot about what's going on. The NBT domain is very clear. Um, when you get to ratios and proportional relationships in middle school, you really don't want to see a lot of problems that don't have a context, right? That is about relationships between quantities. And if you're talking about relationships between quantities, hopefully you're talking about real stuff. Um, so we can learn a lot by doing sort of an unpacking of standards that sits at higher levels than, than the standard level. Um, so we also want to be really explicit about thinking about how rigor unfolds through progressions. I, I've talked about this a little bit today. Um, it's really important to pay attention to. It can help bring all of the elements of the system into alignment. And quite frankly, like if we were more clear in cases where it is clear, if we just say things to teachers like, you know, the grade three number and operation fractions domain is really conceptual. Like it, that means if you're doing work that looks procedural or you're doing a lot of work with word problems, you're probably out of alignment with what the standards are asking for. And I don't take a hard stance, like never do those things, but if you're doing it like frequently, like you might want to question whether you're in alignment to what those standards called for. Um, and then the other thing, and, and this is something we've sort of grappled with a little bit, but at least from an assessment perspective, the highest levels of conceptual and application complexity, we wouldn't call an assessment at grade three unaligned if it didn't reach those. 
And so grade seven, because of looking at progressions and really thinking about sort of content and when, when ideas get integrated and when we're close to that full modeling cycle at high school, grade seven seems like a prime place to really start hitting the level three complexity with application and conceptual understanding. And, and that isn't saying like that we should never engage third graders in a task in the classroom that does some of those things. You know, I think, I think that's fine. But if we were doing an alignment study for an assessment, we wouldn't call a third grade assessment unaligned because we didn't see something that was close to the high school modeling cycle, for example. Um, so those are some closing thoughts. Ted, did you want to add anything? I want to just uh, remind folks also that even though the examples that we used here were uh, primarily down in the lower grades and third grade, that the conversation that we're having translates exceptionally well into high school as well. Yep. All right. So I think, um, I don't know if we want to chat questions or if people want to unmute. Or I think we need to chat the link too, don't we, Ted? Somebody? Yeah, Kelly, if you can put that in the link, that would be helpful. Thanks, Katya. I will just make a quick plug for while folks are thinking about whether they have any questions or follow up. Um, we have an additional webinar on the science cognitive complexity framework. If you have colleagues who might find that useful, um, that will be held next Thursday, the 21st at 2 p.m. Well, if folks have questions that come up afterwards, uh, Shelby and Ted's emails are right there, so feel free to follow up. And uh, if nobody else has any questions right now, thank you all so much for joining. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks. Bye, Bye. everybody.